Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from the great state of Kentucky, Mr. Elroy Larimore, honorary chaplain of the National Rural Water Association. Life all ready to stand, please, for a prayer, then we'll have a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Would you bow with us, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us, and thank you for each one that's present today. And Lord, we thank you for the National Rural Water Association and what it's meant to our states and meant to all our people and our rural water people across America. We just thank you, dear God, for the privilege we had of being a member of this great organization. And Father, we ask you to continue to bless us. Help us, Heavenly Father, to have the right leaders, and dear Heavenly Father, that they'll always look to you for strength and guidance. Go with us now through this meeting today and be with each speaker, and may we always remember that you are in control. Thank you for all your blessings now. In Jesus' name we ask all these favors. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please welcome, from the great state of Louisiana, the National Director, Mr. Wayne Fontenot. There's a lot of people out there. I had Boudreaux and Thibodeau was going to help me out, but he took a peek later on and he said, I'm going back to Lafayette. So uh, I'll, be, I'll take it from here. Uh, welcome to Louisiana. Welcome to New Orleans, Louisiana. I hope you are, your stay here is a pleasant one. Uh, on event, uh, a safe stay. And uh, I would like to just say, uh, if you're going out on the city, have somebody with you. Uh, I'm not saying New Orleans is not a safe city, but I would take precautions anyway. I just want to thank everybody for being here. We hope that your stay here is enjoyable. Uh, it just makes us real proud to, to have you here and to be with us today and the, re all the rest of the week. May God bless you and keep you, and may you enjoy uh, uh, yourselves, your stay here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of the Louisiana Rural Water Association, Mr. Pat Crater.
Bonjour to mes amis. Welcome to uh, Louisiana. Hopefully everyone's having a great time. Uh, the ones uh, of you that have not hit the uh, French Quarter, um, hopefully uh, you do before you uh, leave here. And uh, I wish you all the uh, safe uh, shopping and uh, as much drinking as you can do before you leave. Uh, and don't say you haven't, because I've seen a lot of you out there the last couple of days. And I was just coming from church, so. Uh, We have uh, uh, a guest here with us today that's uh, been a friend of Rural Water for uh, many years. I uh, served with him on the uh, Governor's uh, Water Policy Task Force. Uh, he's been in uh, government for 20-some-odd uh, years. Um, I had a long speech to talk to him about uh, Mr. Angel, and I decided against it because uh, uh, this gentleman here that will be up here in a few minutes has helped out Rural Water tremendously. He's helped us out with our energy conservation programs. He's helped us out with uh, our state compliance programs. And uh, whenever I need this uh, gentleman to assist us, he uh, comes to bat for us. Um, he's uh, served as uh, secretary of the uh, Department of Natural Resources. He's now serving as lieutenant governor under the uh, governor, Bobby Jindal. So would you please put your hands together for my friend, a friend of rural water, Lieutenant Governor Scott Angel. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me this morning to be a part of this day and to, to spend my morning with folks who share my passion for the responsible management of our natural resources. You know, I'm not so sure about after yesterday's game whether or not we ought to let the folks from Georgia in the building today. But nonetheless, because of our outstanding hospitality here in Louisiana, we are going to do the right thing. Uh, but we'll be looking for you during the course of the day. <laughs> and I understand you were scheduled to meet in Nashville this year. And because of Mother Nature and some of the flooding issues there, you had to redirect. And you find yourselves in New Orleans, Louisiana this week. So we first of all say thank you for choosing Louisiana. And I think it's appropriate for us to understand, however, that you are here because of a tragedy in one of our sister states. So we take the time to, uh, to be with our thoughts and prayers to be with those folks, both in uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Mississippi, as they respond. And I do want to say thank you to Pat Crater, the executive director of the Louisiana Rural Water Association, and to my folks from the Louisiana Rural Water Association, let the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Louisiana t say today and every day that the Louisiana Rural Water Association is the best rural water association in the nation. I don't care what the other 49 states say. And I bring greetings to you from Governor General and the men and women of Louisiana who have been working hard day in and day out for the past 161 days as we try to restore our way of life here in coastal Louisiana and never forgetting the 11 great Americans who lost their life in the Deepwater Horizon tragedy. We ask that you uh, keep their families in your thoughts and prayers, and I welcome you to a slice of America that believes we can have it all. At the same time, we produce, explore, refine, and process one-third of the nation's energy. At the same time we do all of that, we also provide 20 percent of the nation's fisheries catch for the lower 48 states. We are not an either-or state in Louisiana. We respect those states that wish to be an either-or state. We believe that the good Lord calls us to manage all of our natural resources simultaneously for the betterment of this nation. And we believe what we have done in Louisiana makes this nation a better place and a more secure nation. And I know you believe that as well, because you do the same thing in your work. And again, welcome to New Orleans, this great city that only five years ago, only five years ago, this great city was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, the worst natural disaster our nation has ever known. I'm here to tell you we've taken our shots, we got to the mat, but we have survived and we have risen to answer the bell. Since that storm, we have worked to rebuild this city block by block, business by business, church by church, house by house. And while there is much work yet to be done, you can see the progress that has been made during your visit here, and we are on our way back to being stronger, smarter, and bolder than ever before, and on behalf of a grateful state, on behalf of a state that five years ago was indeed on its knees, thank you 
for their efforts that you have made both as taxpayers of this country and as citizens and many of you as volunteers helping out as you spend time in New Orleans and after you return to your homes. Please leave with one thing if you leave with nothing, that we in Louisiana appreciate the contributions you have made to help us restore this great city and this great state. Not only did you come to our rescue to help with our infrastructure, you helped to restore, restore our soul, our very soul. So I would like all of us to, if you would please join with me in giving yourselves a round of applause for helping the 18th great state of the union get off of the mat and be here to host you today. Would you please join with me in that round of applause? And earlier this year, earlier, earlier this year, Louisiana was designated as the happiest state in the nation. There was a survey that I'm not real sure what the metrics that were used in that survey, but nonetheless, there's a survey that came out and said that Louisiana was the happiest state in the union. And then about six weeks ago, Business Week came out with a survey that said we were the laziest state in the union. <laughs> and our health, and I'll address that in a second, and our health records, our health records show from time to time that we can be the most obese state in the union. So as America's newest lieutenant governor with jurisdiction over recruiting re re retirees and tourists, I'm looking for any suggestions from this distinguished group on our how I might say, welcome to the land of opportunity, home of fat, happy, and lazy. <laughs> but just to set the record sh straight, that lazy study was clearly not about our work ethic because I will put our work ethic against anybody, anywhere, any place on this planet. It was about how we enjoy our leisure time here in Louisiana, that it's okay to gather around a campfire, it's okay to gather around a tailgate, it's okay to, to, to relax. Not every mountain has to be climbed, and not every, uh, every bayou has to be paddled, that it's okay for us to just uh, enjoy ourselves, and, and we do that here, so you are certainly part of a culture here that knows how to have a good time, knows how to work hard, and knows how to enjoy family. And I'm impressed that you started your, your meeting today uh, with a prayer and a national anthem, because sometimes in this country we forget those things, and I do appreciate your value. Nonetheless, uh, we believe in Louisiana, that we are entering into a stage in this country where water will be the commodity of the 21st century. And uh, we believe in Louisiana, we would have a distinct advantage in that, while other states have fought for generations over water rights and access. In Louisiana, our surface water covers nearly 15% of our state. We have been mostly immune to the so-called water wars, wars. Here, we have more than 6,600 lakes of all sizes, a wealth of rivers, names like the Washita, the Red, the Sabine, the Chanfalaya, and the granddaddy, granddaddy of them all, the mighty Mississippi. That system of rivers and lakes also plays a part in feeding the 13 primary aquifers that provide our groundwater. However, Louisiana is a state that has not always treated water as an asset. In fact, we have often treated it as a liability, a state that has been forced as a matter of public policy to spend billions of dollars actually to get rid of water through our levee systems, our spillways, our locks, and our floodgates. But now with the population growth that we're seeing in the metro centers of America, we realize that our water is an asset, an asset that demands management. It's an asset, wor asset worth protecting and managing to make sure that the next generation can inherit Louisiana's unique position of strength in water resources. And speaking of unique, what a heck of a five years it has been for all of us. We started 2005, remember in 2005, we started oil was trading around $42 a barrel. We watched oil go all the way up by July 4th, 2008, from $42 a barrel, it went to $149 a barrel of oil. You all remember that. You remember when you were paying, some of you in some states of our union paying $5 for gasoline. And then by Christmas, and when the economy imploded in October of 2008, again, we started at 42 five years ago, up to 149 by Christmas, of uh, 2008, it was $36 a barrel. It's starting to sell up somewhere around the $75. During that same five-year period in Louisiana, we saw state government go from a billion-dollar surplus 
to a billion dollar deficit. We experienced Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. We witnessed the election of America's first governor of Indian descent and our first African American president. We have heard in the last five years of carbon capture, cap and trade, climate change, global warming, and yet we witnessed four snowfalls in South Louisiana during those last five years. We've heard of renewable energy, we've heard of alternatives, hydrokinetics, wind, solar, biodiesel, shell plays from saying yes to imported liquefied natural gas to now having too much domestic natural gas, from drill, baby drill, to oil spill, a top kill, a static kill, and a final kill. During the last five years, this generation of Americans witnessed the implosion of the automobile industry, the housing industry, financial markets at near collapse, credit freezes. We learned a new phrase, too big to fail, but in Louisiana, through it all, that five-year period of time, we enjoyed two college football national championships, a national baseball championship, a trip to the Final Four, and after 43 years in football purgatory, a Super Bowl championship. Can I get a hallelujah or an amen? But I think it's appropriate for us to call a timeout and gather around the campfire today here at the uh, Na National Rural Water Association meeting and to discuss some of the major issues facing us as we look forward and understand water resources in the future. Certainly as providers of water, you are very concerned and are called to be stewards of the most critical natural resource on this planet. And in this nation, Rural water systems are the lifeline for small communities providing water that is clean, dependable, and affordable, and adding value to communities as they try to develop their economies. No major economic development story can be told without someone talking about we have water available in our jurisdiction. So what you do is not only important uh, to the families, of America, but certainly to the economic development. I'm aware of the 52,000 community water systems in this nation. Of those 52,000, more than half of them serve 500 people or less, and nine out of 10 serve communities of 10,000 or fewer. And because rural water systems often have to build more infrastructure to reach fewer customers in comparison to more metropolitan areas, costs are naturally going to be higher for rural operations that cannot generate as much revenue. But today I want to introduce you to something that I believe is very, very important and I want to open your eyes and, and ears to uh, a concept uh, that I have been going across the nation talking about. The previous generation dealt with something we all call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that will certainly be a focus for this nation for a long time as we try to understand and improve our educational situation. But I would tell you that the biggest public policy debate of our generation will be what I call the three E's. And those three E's being energy, environment, and economy, and the balance of those three E's. Our need to balance the economic, environmental, and energy policies of this nation is profound. And my fear is that if that is not done in a well-connected, thought-out manner, we will find ourselves in a prolonged economic crisis. And the common factor crucial to all that we do in producing our energy and maintaining our environment and operating our economy, in my opinion, is water. Water is in the bullseye of our efforts to balance those three E's, energy, environment, and economy. In my opinion, if we fix the balance between our energy and environmental policies in this country, we can fix our auto industry. If we fix the balance between our energy and environmental policies in this, in this country, we can fix our housing industry. In my opinion, if we fix the balance between our energy and environmental policies in this country, we can fix a great deal of our credit industry. In fact, I believe water and energy are the critically linked to this nation. Energy production in this nation uses a great deal of water, no matter the source. As an example, every gallon of crude oil refined in this country requires an average of a gallon and a half of water to manufacture the gasoline, diesel, and the other petrochemicals we depend on every, on every day. And as this nation looks more and more to renewable energies, such as biofuels, the need for water will increase. This nation consumed 114 billion gallons of water uh, a day in 2005 and is estimated to grow by 20% to 136 billion in 2030. The water needed for irrigation and production of biofuels alone is expected to grow by 19 
billion gallons a day. We have a great opportunity with regards to natural gas. I'll speak about it in just a second. But one of the keys to natural gas, it is good for our economy, it's good for our environment, it's good for our energy policy, but it does require a tremendous volume of, natural, of, of water to be used to better get that, that, that natural gas to market. So we need to be aware of that. There are going to be more and more demands on the very product that you have to, uh, to, to provide. However, we have to find a balance in America. Our failure to do so will perhaps mean that the next generations of Americans will be the first generation of Americans that do not have it better than the previous generation. A spike in demand will certainly increase the competition for water in this nation including drinking water. And it will mean that we as a country will have to focus appropriately on managing the resource. <clears throat> and so those three E's will also matter in another area I know your members are involved in, the talk of potential climate change legislation and the science that goes with it. I believe we all share the same concern that proposals such as cap and trade would have a huge impact on the primary producers of energy in this nation, the estimates on the last version of such a plan would be anywhere from 50 billion to 300 billion, and we all know that those costs will have to be passed on. And for rural water systems already dealing with the high cost of starting up or expanding and meeting clean water regulations, another expense could be devastating. The United States Department of Agriculture estimated in the last fiscal year that it had funded 2.5 billion in rural water and wastewater projects, and still had 1.3 billion backlog of applications. To, for aid and has already been given notice of another three billion coming. I think it's time for this nation to get serious about providing clean, dependable, and affordable water to every rural community in this country. Our health depends upon it, and I think our economies of our rural communities depend on it as well. Let us realize that every day of our careers, there are going to be challenges as we try to manage the things that we have to manage. And I believe Again, the greatest, generation, the greatest burden of this generation will be to figure out that balance. And, and, and you may be thinking, I thought I came here to a Rural Water Association, but this seems to be an energy, an energy conversation. I just believe that it's so important for you to understand how critical it is to us to reach that balance between energy and environment in this nation. And I absolutely believe that water is going to be at, at, in, in the very bullseye of that. And it, I think you, it, it's important. I don't think it's a message that you're probably hearing in other areas, and you will have many distinguished speakers during this conference that will share things with you. But I wanted to put that on your, uh, on your, on your radar screen. And it's about focus, and I want to share a personal story with you about focus, because I believe that the hardest thing for government has to do is to focus. There are a lot of bright, shiny objects, and we go through the election process, and we change leaders, as so we should. And it's the best system in, in, in the world, but it's not perfect. And it causes us sometimes to lose focus. And I was on a, on a vacation one time. I had just been elected as a parish president, what you call a county commissioner. And it was a tough year, and it was the year 2000. And my wife and I, we have five kids, and I decided I was going to take my family on a vacation. And we were going to leave South Louisiana, and we were going to drive up to Minnesota. And that was during the month of December. And that was the first mistake, that I would drive as a, as a country boy from, from, from a small South Louisiana community all the way up to Minnesota. And it was so cold that year, that particular time of the year, that in Shreveport, Louisiana, it actually snowed for the Independence Bowl, and I'm on my way to Minnesota, so you can begin to figure out what I'm going through. And uh, so we didn't have the, 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 the resources to fly, and as I said, we drove and we got the SUV, we loaded up the wife and the five kids, and I, put, I was pulling a U-Haul, you know, and I thought I'd bring some of the things up to my sister up there. And, in between Alexandria, Louisiana, and Natchitoches, Louisiana, on Interstate 49, there's not a whole bunch. And uh, in fact, I don't even know if th at that particular point 10 years ago, there was a whole bunch of civilization in that little area on Interstate 49. It was a recently completed area. And my wife leans over and she says, Scott, you know, this story is about losing focus, y'all. And my wife leans over and says, Scott, you know, I think you're almost out of gas. And I look and I say, well, you know, I'm thinking to myself. She said, you know, we are hour and a we're going on a 23 hour trip. And an hour and a half into the trip, we are already almost out of gas. You know, if this would have been one of your constituents calling about the garbage being picked up, oh, you would have took care of that. If this would have been one of your constituents talking about a pothole, you would have took care of that. But we got your family right here, your five kids, we're on Interstate 49, and you didn't even fill up to go to Minnesota? I mean, what kind of leader are you? 
And I said, don't worry, baby, don't worry, we'll get off the interstate, and of course it's dark, and we're trying to, you know, I'm doing my thing, and I got the little pucker factor going, because I'm not so sure I'm going to make it, you know. And I get off the first exit, and there's nothing, I get back on, I get back off, get back on, and clearly there is not anything there to be found. And I'm beginning to go through my options. One of my options is that I would stay in the vehicle with my five kids, and I'd send my wife to go get gas. <laughs> or, 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 she would stay with the five kids, and I would go get gas, and I didn't le like either one of those options, but the first one appealed to me a whole lot more. <laughs> but anyway, and of course, there was a no service light on with the cell phone, and we do what every uh, one of you have done from one time to another. We actually make it to that gas station in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and we run out of gas at the gas pump, and my wife says, I think we're going to sleep here tonight. I'm like, well, we're on, we on a 23-hour trip. We can't, we can't sleep here. We're an hour and a half into this deal. There's no way we can do that. Yeah, I'm so stressed out. There's no way I can get back on the road. So, of course, being the, the real man I am, I start unloading and say, yes, ma'am. And, uh, <laughs> and we, end up, we end up staying there in, uh, in Natchitoches. And the next morning, she gets up and she says, look, we got a new rule today. And that rule is when we get to a quarter of a tank, we're going to stop and get gas. We're not going to do this again. I said, oh, okay, that's not bad. She said, no, I want to make sure you understand. Not when we get to a quarter of a tank, when we burn a quarter of a tank, we're going to stop getting gas. I don't, tr <laughs> I don't trust you. I don't trust you. And I just want to make sure that we do this. So, you know, every 42 miles, we get in and off the interstates of America. And we stop in Texarkana, Arkansas, and we buy a few things at the Walmart there. And we put some of those things behind the vehicle in, in, in the SUV, and we put some of those things in the, in, in the U-Haul, and we going down the road, and now we in the state of Iowa. It's minus 35 wind chill factor, and my wife is running out of film that she bought at Texarkana Walmart for her little camcorder. So she signals to the kids in the back, hey, get, look in the back while well, I put one of those bags. I think my film is in there. Would you get it for me? And uh, the kids can't find it, and, and she's kind of starting to get a little aggravated. She didn't want to miss any of the, any of the, uh, the, the, the landscape for her a little home video. I was like, look, not to worry, we'll be stopping to get gas soon, and we can look. <laughs> and, and sure enough, uh, you know, I, we stop in Iowa, and I unlock the U-Haul. I said, maybe you put in a U-Haul, and I'll, you know, do a roll top. And I said, look, just get in there and look, and I'll, you know, put the gas, did the gas, go inside to get my, pay for my gas, and get my hot chocolate. And she comes in to meet me, and she says, I can, cannot, and this story is about losing focus, y'all. She said, I cannot find that bag. I don't know where it's at. And I said, well, certainly, we bought it. I had the receipt in my pocket. I said, you know, we, we bought it. We paid for it. And, you know, we put it. I'm sure we put it in the back. Why don't you just go look in the back again? You know, somewhere. So she said, okay, why don't you go ahead and get me some hot chocolate, too? I do that, finish my transaction, get to the vehicle, open the door, put my hot chocolate and her hot chocolate into the console, and I take off, and we are rolling. And I'm kind of, you know, just in my own world. This story's about losing focus. And, and Jean-Paul, Jean who is our youngest son and by far his mother's favorite, says, Daddy, where's Mama? <laughs> and I said, well, Mama's in the back looking for, looking for the film. And in South Louisiana, we got the back, and in the third seat at the SUV is the back back. So I said, he said, Mama's not in the back. I said, well, I think Mama's in the back back. And he said, he jumps over, and he comes back. He said, Daddy, he's like five years old. He said, Mama's not in the back. And Mama's not in the back back. I think Mama's in the back of that thing we pulling behind our truck. <laughs> and sure enough, I pull over on Interstate 35 in the state of Iowa, and out comes my wife in the back of that U-Haul. <laughs> when, when I told her to go look in the back, I understood she was going in the, in, in the back of the SUV, and she thought I was instructing her to go in the U-Haul. And I completely lost focus. And that story is a true story, and I'll share it with you because how hard could it be? I mean, you know, it's difficult for a man who's traveling with a woman for 20 hours, who's the mother of his five kids, to completely to, to get on the road and not know where she's at. <laughs> and I'll share that story with you because, again, it's true. And number two, I think it does bring uh, for you all something that is very obvious, and that is it's, it's easy to lose focus. It's easy to lose focus in government. It's easy to lose focus on what you do. And I, I think that um, I, would, I would certainly encourage you uh, to be about focus. I would encourage you to understand the vital statistics of your organization, what drives 
uh, your success, for your board of directors to stay focused, uh, to, 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 to know what's important, to make sure uh, that you can stay in balance. Because the loss of focus, it doesn't take long. I think we found out in this country uh, that when we lose focus, when we take a few things for granted, uh, some things uh, don't end up the way we want. Finally, in closing, I'd like to share with you, um, you all aware of this tragedy we have in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I will be testifying tomorrow uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, to the Presidential Commission on the Gulf Oil Spill, talking about a few things here. Uh, but it's important, as you have again been called to come to our assistance, in a different way this time. We needed you physically five years ago, uh, and many of you responded uh, and provided tremendous, tremendous resources. What I want to tell you is that I think it's important the number one group of people that have been negatively impact, impacted by this oil spill, obviously the lives of, of, and the families of the, of the lost Americans. I get that and you get that as well. But the fishing industry, and understand that the number one tourist asset we have in this state is our food. That's a historical, that's not what I believe, that's not what I think, that is what I know, that's what people for 25 years have told us. That the number one reason people come to Louisiana, they come for a lot of reasons. They come for our music, they come for our culture, they come for our history, they come for our coastal marshlands, they come for our hunting and our fishing, they come for a lot of things. But the number one reason people come here is for our cuisine. And that has been negatively impacted because of some of the images. Unfortunately, those images are not reality because we have had several seafood uh, tests that have been done and independent after independent report indicates that our seafood is healthy. I am hopeful that during your time here, you are enjoying some of that. Um, and to borrow uh, from Forrest Gump, y'all remember the story, Forrest Gump's wartime partner, tell them they can get all the shrimp barbecue, shrimp ball, shrimp brawl, shrimp bake, baked shrimp, pan fried shrimp, deep fried shrimp, stir fried shrimp, shrimp kebab, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, pineapple shrimp, lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, shrimp stew, shrimp soup, shrimp salad, shrimp potato, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich, and any other way they want it. Okay? Y'all know, know the movie I'm talking about. The one thing that you can do in addition to praying for us, and as we agree to pray for you, is that Instead of eating seafood one time a week when you go back home to 49 other states, that you eat it twice a week. And you demand in your marketplaces, you demand in your marketplaces, you demand in your restaurants when you go that you ask for Louisiana seafood. If we would do that, if every American would double down on their purchases of seafood, and what kind of sacrifice is that, really, when you stop and think about it? <laughs> I don't want to hurt my friends in Iowa. I love Iowa beef. Uh, and we got a lot of protein there, and I get it. And, uh, and, and I, I would just say that, that, that now is a time for all of us to come together, and if we will double down on our seafood purchases, I believe uh, that we can help again, and before long, long, we will be back along our way. Again, on behalf of a grateful state, I thank you for the tremendous help that you gave us five years ago. We hope that we never, ever, ever have to pay you back for it, but know that we are a state that is ready to respond at a moment's notice. And the beauty of a union is to be a part of a family. And uh, certainly, we are part of that great family. And as we say in Louisiana, uh, a couple different ways, as you go and you do the hard work that you have to do, uh, you would say, let the good times roll. And we would say, les ailes bon temps roulé. Thank you all very much for having me. And have a great trip. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the president of the National Rural Water Association, Mr. Fred Sheldon. Thank you. Rodney, you can bring the speech down now. Uh, Sam told me I had to talk a long time. I don't have a lot to prepare, but uh, ex-president Tart 
told me he'd fix me up, so I'm sure he's going to bring something down for me to talk about. Before he does that, though, I would like to, one, welcome you all here. You've been welcomed before, but I just want to pass that on for myself. Also to tell you that come Wednesday is called uh, Rural Development Appreciation Day, and uh, these folks have become very good and close friends of ours, and as you see them through the halls and classrooms, uh, go up and thank them for everything that they've done for us. We're going to be probably going on to some troubled times. There's lots of people worried uh, what's going to happen to rural water, uh, the way the elections are looking like they're going, and the Republicans come in or the Tea Party comes in or all that. Uh, I was sitting with some friends of mine, uh, past presidents, that this isn't the first time this has happened. But what we need to do and we need to concentrate on doing is make sure that the relationships that you've started, you continue with, and those that you need after November, you need to start harvesting, go out and do it. It's extremely important. Don't wait for the executive director. Don't wait for the board of directors to go do it, but go do it yourselves. Write them letters. Thank them for what they're doing. Let them know what you do. Let them know how important you are. If you do that, we'll continue the way we are. Oh, there's a speech right here. Uh, I can follow up on this one. But uh, if you do that, we're going to be in good shape. And as I've told you in the past couple of years that I've been president, to don't forget to thank them. That's extremely important. Our friends from Rural Development will tell you that they appreciate being thanked. It's really easy to say that through the ARRA process that all this money went out, but I didn't get any. Or the paperwork's too hard. Well, nothing comes free. And if you're successful in getting that money, you know, a little appreciation, a little thanks will go a long ways. With that, Sam's really nervous. I'm going to talk a long time. And uh, as all of you that have had me speak before you know I really don't, enjoy the conference. Have a good time. Thanks. I get to introduce our next speaker. He's a gentleman who has uh, spent the last 20 years providing training programs, seminars, and keynote addresses to uh, schools, parents, teachers, and corporate America. His concern for his students encouraged him to go ahead and get his uh, a master's degree in counseling and then further a doctoral degree in counseling psychology. He's from Oklahoma, Dr. Chuck Jackson. Well, good morning. reflecting on me here. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for those kind words and motivating comments. I need to remind you of just a couple of things that are a little bit different at the Water Pro Conference than in the past. Tonight, the awards dinner will be held in this room, so we would invite you to join us as we recognize your associations, your, your membership utilities, and individuals for, for their work this past year. On Wednesday evening, will be the uh, a banquet, and that will be held in the other end of the conference center. And that's when we recognize President Sheldon for all of his work and welcome the N new president of NRWA, uh, Joe Lyles from the great state of Kentucky. And speaking of President Sheldon, he's been to each one of your conferences over the past two years, and I can't count the uh, number of hours and days that he's volunteered and devoted to the leadership of your organization. Would you recognize that one more time? Thank you. You know, it's the little things that you do that make rural water what it is today, that make it a success. And when those little things that you do on a daily basis are combined with those of your peers here and across the nation, the end product is something much bigger much better and more successful than one individual could hope to achieve. I'd like to ask you to do three things while you're here this, this week, and you've already heard them, but let me just reinforce them. Number one, 
little thing I'd like to ask you to do is go in the exhibit hall and thank our exhibitors for their support, not only of your state association, but of the Water Pro Conference. And recognize USA Blue Book as our diamond sponsor. Aqua Store, or Engineering Storage Products, is our five-star sponsor. Ford Meter Box and Caldwell Tanks. Those are the groups that just do a little bit extra and support our organization and our industry throughout the year. And that means so much. Just that little thank you, as you heard earlier, means so much. The second thing I'd like to ask you to do and reinforce what President Sheldon said, on Wednesday is RUS Appreciation Day. They've been under a tremendous amount of pressure these past two years to get the R of money out, to dot every I, cross every T, and they've brought a lot of people here from state rural development offices as well as the USDA office. The administrator of RUS will also be here on, on uh, uh, Wednesday at the closing session to speak with you. Walk up and just say thank you. They don't get that very often, and they're the people that fund all of our water and wastewater systems across the country. The third thing I'd like you to do is make a friend. Yesterday morning, quarter to six, waiting on Starbucks to open. There was one other individual down there, Gary Smith from La rural Lorraine County in Ohio. And we got to talking, and he said, well, I've been coming 15 years, just hadn't had a chance to talk to you. And that's sort of a shame because everybody's busy. So I'd like to ask you to do that little thing and make a new friend. And like Gary and I did, we solved the economic crisis in our country. <laughs> There's no more political turmoil. And if everybody does that, I think we'll be just fine. Thank you for everything you do. It's those little things that you do that make rural water what it is today. The nation's largest 27,919 utilities the largest organization in our nation. Thank you so much for that. It's those little things that you do that create success. It's the little things that got the RO money and over $4 billion through rural development out building and upgrading water and wastewater systems. It's the little things you do that will see us through and future growth in the future. Thank you for your leadership of our industry. Thank you for the leadership of our association, and thank you for the leadership of Rural America. Have a great conference in the Crescent City. And with that, we'll see you tonight. Thank you. They hit it right on the money. My PowerPoint never went up. Mm -mm. They run the, they run my screen. Yeah. Hey, thank you. thank you. Enjoyed it. You're a fun group. Really good. Thank so, you. do you have a card? Would you like to come to Montana? Oh, I would love to come to Montana. Uh, Jim, where did that end up? Hang on. Concoction, this wonderful powdered uh, actual berries. Explain what, what's. Um, in the rub for uh, this fish. Uh, it's actually, it's a... Uh,